Economists are hesitant to have government tell people what is best for them. But a behavioral economist suggests that the government might be able to nudge people's choices in a positive way. Now, there, this is kind of a loaded statement in that, one, economists generally like to stay in the realm of positive analysis and not venture too far into normative analysis. We don't really want to say as much about what should be as about what actually is. Um, positive analysis, analysis of what is. Normative analysis, analysis of what ought. Um, so whenever we say a positive way, if we're going to nudge people's choices in a positive way, we have to make a value judgment about which way is the positive way, which is normative analysis. Now, there are some that I think we can pretty universally agree. For example, smoking. Uh, tobacco is bad for you. It has nicotine in it. Nicotine in a concentrated form is a very effective pesticide. Uh, it causes cancer. It causes hypertension. I mean, just all kinds of bad things are caused by smoking. Well, we might have things that the government can do to nudge people away from making that decision of smoking. For example, we might charge a higher tax on cigarettes. That does two things. Number one, if you smoke, you're going to have a higher cost to society in terms of your lost output and your medical costs. So um, you pay a little tax to make up for that. Um, also, it's a financial disincentive to smoke. It becomes more expensive, and so you want to smoke less. Now, how effective is that in keeping in getting people to quit smoking? Probably not very effective because it's a highly addictive substance. Um, how effective would it be in preventing people from smoking in the first place? Maybe stopping children from smoking? Well, the tax might be a little bit, but even better is just, well, you can't smoke before you're a certain age. And it's pretty well shown that if you don't start smoking before say 18, 19, 20, you're probably not going to start smoking. So that might be another thing. There's also ad campaigns and public service announcements. There's lots of things the government can do to try to nudge people's behavior in a way that we think is positive. How choices are presented affects people's choices and make uh, uh, affects people. How choices are presented affects the choice people make and nudges take uh, this into account. For example, um, camel cigarettes all right, were actually seen uh, many years ago as an old person's brand. All right, and then camel figured out that old people don't start smoking. Old people stop smoking. Why do they stop smoking? They stop smoking because they get lung cancer and die. They need to get young people to smoke. And so Joe Camel was born. And because they presented this in a different way, it became a young person's cigarette, all right? Because they used a cartoon to get really young people to um, um, buy into the product. Well, we saw that and decided to make that not okay. And so Joe Camel has gone away with some, some regulation that happened as a result. Uh, but the way a choice is presented really makes a difference. One example is the default option bias. All right, generally speaking, if we have a choice between the status quo and something new, if we don't see a real reason to switch to something new, we stay with the status quo. Now, a lot of times that makes sense. For example, uh, I've got a computer software package that works fine. I don't need any improvement. It meets my needs. They come along with a new program that's going to cost me time in learning how to use the new program. Well, if I don't have a significant reason for switching to the new program, I don't want to incur the cost because the cost-benefit analysis doesn't work out. All right, That's an example where this default bias actually might be kind of smart. There's other ways where it's not smart at all. all right? We just have this default bias, and even though we have this major benefit from switching to the new technology. Um, we value the status quo enough that, well, we, we don't take that into account. We just don't, we don't, um, we stay with the default even though the new one would be better. So, next we need to kind of deal with 
market failures, and government failures. If the government's going to interact in the economy and be a po force for good or a positive force in the economy, we have to kind of get an idea of, well, when things go wrong, why did they go wrong? So market failures are situations in which the market does not lead to a desired result. Either it's inefficient, in the case of an externality, we don't produce the right amount of something, or the result is, for some reason, undesirable. Uh, a great example of this was in the 19th century, um, child labor was quite common in the United States. We decided that was an undesirable result and passed regulation protecting child workers. So you can only work very limited amount at young ages and, and only in very special circumstances. Right. Government failures are situations in which the government makes a mistake. All right, the government gets involved and messes things up even more. All right, we well say, well, that's any time the government gets involved. Well, no, not really. Government gets involved in lots of things and does a pretty good job of taking care of them. But there are times when, well, things go wrong, and that tends to be what we focus on. So policymakers have to decide which failure is least problematic. Um, so if the market failure is big enough that the um, problems caused by government intervention are, are um, overwhelmed by the benefit of correcting the market failure, then the policymaker needs to make the decision to go in and have, have some intervention there. If not, they need to make the decision to leave things alone. All right, so if you want some extended reading, I um, encourage you to take a look at this link for um, a little extended reading on externalities.